Okay, welcome um, everybody to the, the Populism Seminar. This is our, our last session of the season, but um, we have two great presentations. Um, the session is called The Psychology of Populism, and we have Kai Sam Schumacher from the University of Amsterdam and Rodolfo um, Sarsfield from an autonomous um, university of um, um, Ketera, um, Keter, Keretaro, <laughs> sorry, um, yes. my tongue, got my tongue caught there. Um, we, we're going to do a little bit of a, a, a sort of an adjustment. Normally we do two presentations and then we have a discussion, but um, we have a, a corona childcare issue with, with Gais. So Gais would like to present his paper and then do a discussion. And with Rodolfo, we have an electricity um, issue. So he's, um, his city doesn't have electricity now, so he hasn't shown up yet. So hopefully he will have electricity. So maybe this works out uh, well. So hopefully um, Rodolfo will, will join us um, in, a, in a few minutes. Um, so just a quick reminder before I continue that we still have our open call for our spring, um, our spring session. Go to our website and, um, and you can submit your abstract. And um, there's some, for maybe the, the title of your talk and also the preference for when you would like to do it. I think Robert reminded me it's until Valentine's Day. Is that right? Because it's a work of, work of love, of course, <laughs> to, to, um, to present by us. Um, we'll talk more about it again at the end. We do have some house rules, which I'll quickly mention. Um, it's going to be recorded or we've already started recording. Hope you're okay with that. Um, there's two ways to um, ask a question. You can type your question in the Q&A or you can raise your hand um, with the icon and ask the um, question in person. Um, so I'll turn the floor over to Kais. So Kais, um, tell us all about, um, about what you're gonna tell us about. Um, I'll stop sharing and I'll give it to you. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Andre. And uh, it's great to, to present here. And I must say, if I have to choose between an electricity problem and a Corona childcare problem, I prefer Corona childcare uh, every day. Uh, let me share my screen. Um, here it is. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about joint work with uh, Matthijs uh, Rodan and uh, uh, Bert Bakker. And uh, let me jump right through it. Um, so I don't know, about nine out of 10 papers I get to review about populism. And they typically start with this discussion that uh, 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 populism is a difficult to define concept and, uh, and then yeah they, 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 they continue but they have to do this little song and dance in the beginning um, one of the things that is not typically part of a definition of populism but is very often mentioned is the fact or, or the statement that, that, uh, that populism makes use of highly emotional rhetoric and that this rhetoric uh, has a, a deep impact on people, a gut level impact on uh, people. Um, I'm not saying this should be part of the definition of populism, not at all. Um, but what is interesting is that we, we very often talk about this emotional layer of populism, but actually we rarely research it. Some very recent interesting research now shows that populist rhetoric in, in, in parliament, for example, is indeed more emotional, particularly making use of, of uh, specific discrete emotions such as anger and fear. Um, we also know from experimental research that in response to populist rhetoric, people self-report emotions such as anger and fear. And so these, this, 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 this very small bit of literature uh, that has all been published very recently uh, does seem to suggest what we think is uh, uh, true about populism, namely that it has this uh, deep emotional core. Um, yet what I will show today, uh, based on our research, um, it, it, it will lead us to question such conclusions. Um, so uh, what are the first steps uh, 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 we make in this in this research is that uh, political science as a whole, so not per se the populism uh, 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 research area in itself, but political science as a whole studies sort of the, the very end of the emotional process. I mean, emotion should be considered as a process from that 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 you know that goes from 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 from, from particular brain activity that that, that 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 is activated very quickly after exposing people to the stimulus uh, uh most of that brain activity we're completely unaware of uh, that brain activity 
uh, subsequently has as um, also particularly outward consequences. For example, uh, people's face, the facial muscles may be activated in a particular way. And also uh, heartbeats may change, um, skin conductance may change. I'll, I'll say a bit more about that later. Um, and that's also still all pretty much unconscious. And then at one point, your brain starts to tell you like, okay, you feel angry, you feel uh, uh, anxious. Uh, 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 but in this, and, and uh, that's what we typically uh, uh, pick up with if we uh, administer self-reports to, uh, to our experimental participants. Um, but the problem with these conscious, with purely focusing on unconscious self-reports of emotions is that these may be biased products of this emotional process. In the end, politics is a highly contested arena. Populism is a highly contested concept. So people who take a survey, and we know that uh, they do it in this way, they, 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 they think about what the social desirable answers may be to the question. And so... That's problematic if we really want to understand the emotional process that people experience when we expose them to populist rhetoric. So self-reports can be biased. Uh, also, another problem with self-reports is that we cannot really capture the emotional process. We can expose someone uh, uh, to populist rhetoric, but then with self-reports, we, we can only administer after, they've saw, after they saw the experiment what their feelings are. And so ideally, of course, you capture these emotions in the process of showing them the treatment. And that's what we did. Oops. Uh, oh. Yep. Ah, here. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, a lot of our research makes use of uh, physiological measures. And, and so this, this particular study is just an example of a larger set of studies in which we particularly try to capture uh, a, a facial electromyography. So these are uh, these try to capture small activations of particular muscle muscle regions, and we are particularly interested in uh, uh, capturing uh, corrugator muscle activity, which is that those are captured by the two black electrodes above the eyebrow, and these. Uh, 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 these muscle re regions are correlated with uh, the experience of negative effect. And then psychomatics activity is associated with uh, positive effect, and that's captured by the black electrodes on, uh, 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 on your cheek uh, uh, region. And then finally, um, uh, emotion can, of course, be seen as a construct of, of positive and negative, but it's also about a level of arousal. And this is picked up by skin conductance. Uh, uh, measures, very old measure already, that picks up um, the, um, uh, uh, yeah, which essentially picks up uh, the, the sweat that is secreted through uh, the glands in your, in your fingers. Uh, and this is associated with uh, becoming uh, physiologically aroused. Uh, so these are the measures we used to capture uh, uh, emotion in this uh, particular project. Uh, now, we did an experiment in which we uh, created a pro-establishment versus an anti-establishment video. So we really zoom in here on the anti-elite dimension of populism. So this talk is not so much about people centrism. It's also not about particular host ideology that populist parties may adopt. It's really about this difference between pro and anti-establishment. We did data collection at six different sites. So we had a mobile lab that we deployed at different locations in the Netherlands, as well as in the university lab. And in total, we had 343 unique participants and half of them were exposed to the pro-establishment and the other half were exposed to the anti-establishment treatment. And I wanna show you now uh, uh, our anti-establishment uh, uh, treatment. Uh, so I'm going to switch to uh, my VLC, I hope you can actually see this. Uh, if not, then please let me know. <laughs> uh, and, and so it's, it's, it's a 40 second video clip with text in Dutch, uh, but I put subtitles in there in a very clumsy way. And, uh, and there's music as well. Hey guys, we, we can't see you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> You can't see it. No. New share. 
right? Now? Now, yes. Yeah, now I think so, yes. Okay, that's just two seconds in, so. Okay, so that's it. And uh, so what's what's really important to emphasize here that we deliberately chose not to show any populist politicians, uh, not to talk about people's interests, not to talk about something about immigrants, uh, but really to capture only this 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 anti-establishment uh, aspect. I'm going to show you the pro-establishment treatment now. Uh, just the text, uh, the video was almost the same. Uh, but so the wording is different. And I must say, and we'll return to this issue as well, we had a lot more difficulty writing this text than uh, writing the anti-establishment text. So we tried to come up with the reverse. So what we're uh, trying to emphasize is that they that they are hardworking, they they're put the interest of the Dutch people first, and that they are capable of bridging these differences and we should be proud of their work. That That's essentially the, uh, 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 the bottom line of the text. Okay, so uh, we contrasted these uh, 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 two uh, different treatments. Our analysis plan was pre-registered. Uh, we're mostly interested in the difference between pro and anti-treatments, uh, but we're also interested in differences within these treatments because different things are set. Uh, what we're also interested in are differences between participant characteristics in terms of education, uh, uh, political knowledge, uh, agreeableness, cynicism, etc. And as you can see, these are already a whole bunch of things. In total, this, this contains about 1,200 different analysis. And so we also uh, adjusted our p-value uh, accordingly. So in the end, not much is significant. <laughs> uh, our main finding indeed is that there is no significant difference in terms of arousal, in terms of negative effect, or in terms of positive effect between the anti-establishment and the pro-establishment video. And of course, this contrasts with our expectations because we expected the anti-establishment video to be well, minimally more arousing, but also that people would experience more negative valence towards it because on average, most voters do not support populist parties. So they should be, uh, 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 they should be experiencing negative emotions when they see this video. Um, we also looked at some subgroup differences and there's some evidence there that voters of populist radical right parties experience more negative effect vis-a-vis -vis the pro-establishment treatment. And this is a finding, uh, uh, we call this the incongruency finding. This is a finding we find also in other research that if we show people uh, 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 information they disagree with, then their corrugator is activated. They, they experience negative effect. And so we find this exactly for these PRR voters in the pro-establishment treatment, but we do not find it for all the other voters in the anti-establishment treatment. So in this case, the incongruency effect just seems to work one way. Education, cynicism, agreeable interest and knowledge do nothing in terms of explaining differences between anti-establishment and pro-establishment videos. They do, however, explain differences within these treatments. And that, that's something I will show uh, to you now. Uh, so uh, this is the uh, uh, pro-establishment treatment. So on the x-axis, you see the different time periods within the treatment. So these are seconds. And so there are different segments. It starts just with music. Then there's this emphasis on, on big issues. If they work hard, they bridge differences. We should be proud there at the end of our representatives here. Um, and then uh, they solve hey, problems. Hey guys, I don't want to interrupt you, but your slides, you're showing the presenter. It didn't matter till now, but now maybe it's 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 um, easier okay. to see. Sorry, I don't, I don't. You're going so well. I didn't want to do that. Uh, oh, this one. Yeah. Good. Better. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. It's a lot bigger. Um, yeah. So these are. The, this is the time uh, uh, within the treatment on the x-axis, and these segments are the different. Uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, different segments within uh, uh, the treatment. And so it's, it begins with music and it ends with music. Now, and so what you see plotted here is 
corrugator activity, cecomaticus activity, and skin conductance, that's SCL activity. And we distinguish between uh, 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 um, PRR voters here, those are the blue lines, and non-PRR voters, and those are uh, uh, the red lines. And uh, 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 what you can see here, the statistically, I mean, there are a lot of differences, but the statistically significant differences are that there is more arousal uh, in the, for the blue line, so that the PRR voters compared to other voters, and also uh, uh, more corrugator activity. So uh, um, this, this, again, uh, this, this stresses this finding I mentioned before, but then over the entire treatment, that these radical right voters, they are experiencing the incongruency effect. Um, then uh, if I go to the next slide, oh. sorry, yep. Uh, this is the anti-establishment treatment. So uh, there's a part with music again, uh, that they ignore the people, they're self-interested, they should be ashamed, and we should remove the elite, and it ends with a little bit of music as well. Uh, here, the, uh, it's clear that the red group is physiologically more aroused by the anti-establishment treatment. Now, you might say this is the incongruency effect, but it's not entirely in line with, with all the other things we have found before about the incongruency effect, because that is mostly corrugator activity. And we don't find any difference between the two groups in terms of corrugator activity. The, the, the red line is essentially contained by the blue line. So there's really no uh, difference. Uh, there is a lot more zecomaticus activity, however, in the red line. That's obvious. I mean, the two are completely separate. Yeah, I mean, the interpretation of this could be twofold. On the one hand, uh, it could be that people are really amused by anti-establishment uh, rhetoric. Uh, the other explanation could be that PRR voters really relax their, uh, during uh, PRR, uh, uh, sorry, during populist uh, rhetoric. But again, we expected here high corrugator activity for the uh, other photo groups, and, and we don't really find this. Yes. Okay. So, uh, uh, in conclusion, the question, uh, uh, um, the surprise, the most surprising thing of this research is that populist rhetoric does not seem, or at least anti-elitist rhetoric, does not seem to be as hot as pro-establishment rhetoric is. Uh, and, 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 and we think, uh, yeah, that's really surprising to us. We had uh, anticipated a different result. Of course, you can say the first logical explanation would be to blame it on the treatment. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. We, again, we had a lot of difficulty writing the pro-establishment treatment simply because we did not have many examples. And that, that's kind of strange. So for, uh, 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 so this, this research is part of a, 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 we had a whole set of experiments on different political issues and for each issue, and as well for the anti-establishment rhetoric here, we had, we took examples from existing speeches of politicians and it was fairly easy to construct a story there. It was much more difficult to construct a pro-establishment rhetoric. Here. And so in the end, Novelty is a really important element of uh, 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 experimental treatment. So perhaps the fact that we don't find a difference between, on average, between anti and pro-establishment rhetoric might be that the pro-establishment rhetoric is somehow completely novel to people. And that the anti-establishment rhetoric is the stuff they've been hearing for 20 years now here in the Netherlands, and they've com become completely accustomed to it and, and, and maybe even bored by it. Uh, so that's one possible explanation, and it leads to the, the broader question, like what is, what is really the counter story to anti-elite rhetoric? Uh, we don't seem to be using so much pro-elite uh, rhetoric. Um, and indeed, uh, uh, well, I've already mentioned that maybe we've simply become too familiar with anti-establishment rhetoric to, uh, 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 to experience these, these, these strong unconscious emotional responses. And so that, that, that has also consequences on the effect that anti-establishment rhetoric at this stage in uh, the political evolution of the Netherlands or Western European, Western, Euro Western Europe at large has, uh, uh, and, and, and that's something, uh, yeah, that's an implication we should consider. Um, so uh, that's, that's what I wanted to uh, 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 talk about regarding uh, this particular paper on populism and, and physiological responses. If you want to read more uh, of, our, of the work of the Hot Politics Lab on, on, on either populism or physiology, then I can 
I can recommend you uh, uh, to uh, one of these papers I've, I've listed here, um, uh, particularly well, one and three deal with populism and personality and two and four are particularly about physiology. Uh, and then leaves me just to thank my colleagues in the Hot Politics Lab and co-authors. And I look forward to your questions. Hey, thank you very much, guys. Um, I'll turn it over to Robert and Annika, who are going to um, um, do the moderation now. Um, but in some cases, I guess you just proved um, Kasmuda um, correct. We live in a populist zeitgeist, <laughs> in the sense that um, it doesn't have it, it doesn't have an effect, or or something like that. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, guys. Uh, we've got sort of 10, 15 minutes because I think you said you, you needed sort of to, to leave around one o'clock. So, um, and we already have two questions, uh, which is fantastic. So I'll hand over to Carola and then uh, Lisa. Carola first, and I'm going to unmute you right now. Okay, hello. Uh, I'm not sure if you see me, but... Maybe is that not, not needed? <laughs> um, uh, I have a question for, uh, I think indeed that it's extremely difficult to make such an experiment in this uh, time in which uh, the framing is so much populist in the Netherlands. But maybe, uh, did you, I have a question, did you consider, for instance, to, to look in uh, real uh, life uh, rhetoric, like the uh, political debates in, uh, like uh, around the new government or in September, the, uh, the debates around the new, uh, the new political year. Because you can find like uh, discussions between uh, builders and Rutter and they're really very much about the same issue and, and, and oppose their rhetoric very much. And maybe you can uh, make use of that, maybe. Or maybe you think that's not uh, appropriate or uh, useful, then I'm... Uh, uh, I'm curious what you think about that. Yeah, um, trying to recall some of these debates, but uh, at least one, one, at least what I remember of it is, is a lot of it is about the tone, uh, what the Rutte says that that you know they 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 cross a line, and that that this is not a way to talk about to talk to your colleagues. Um, I think I mean that that that's definitely. Um, uh, would be really interesting also to investigate whether that works. Um, but I can't really recall anything that yeah would 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 stress this sort of pro pro elite rhetoric. Perhaps only about sort of this aspect of sort of taking responsibility. But but I think that 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 was that was at least a little bit in our pro establishment treatment. Thank you. I think uh, we're getting quite a few uh, questions and um, let's maybe take the next two together. I'll uh, unmute uh, Lisa and then I'm going to uh, read out one that is in the uh, Q&A. Um, yes, thank you guys for this really interesting presentation. So I exactly wrote that question down that you answered later, like what about the um, non-populist voters or anti-populists? And you of course answered that. But I was still wondering, like, is there actually an opposite to populism? Is it really anti-populism or is it just the absence of populism? Yeah. Because, I mean, um, for all the things that define populism, so, I mean, it's really hard to define people centrism, but I'd say it's even harder to define anti-people centrism. And yeah. also with, maybe for pluralism, it's working, I guess. Yeah. And I think there's more research needed to actually find out if there's populism and anti-populism, or if you actually need a third video or third control group um, with a like with nothing happening. And I think that's really, it's really interesting what you found. And it's, I don't think that the treatment is wrong. It's just like this weird side guys that we're so used to it and that most people or a majority yeah. reacts like disgusted or amused. But yeah. of course, this is kind of like, that's not what we want to find. We want to know what like, what makes it that like populist rhetoric is so arousing, but actually in which direction and not just into disgust or like entertainment. So I'm sorry that I don't have a question, but I think it was really <laughs> interesting. 
No, but I, uh, I, I do have a response. Um, and I, I mean, uh, the, I mean, your question is, is, is populism a valence issue? So is it, is it just a, at least how political scientists use the term valence? So is it, is it a one directional issue? Something like cl climate for long was also a valence issue, right? There was only, there was only pro-climate. There was not a, there was, there was not a focal anti-climate uh, 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 side in, 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 in the political debate. Uh, and this, of course, in the last five years has completely changed. And so, uh, and it might very well be that you're right that there is no, there is no opposite uh, of of anti-establishment rhetoric, uh, but that 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 does not that that just means that it's not there currently, and so and and I think what we found out a little bit by trying to create the treatment is that that yeah that it is not there currently, but it doesn't mean that it that it will always be like it. So 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 maybe this. Uh, this would also be a call to develop such rhetoric, to develop such an argument in that uh, debate. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's take two questions uh, together from the Q&A. So Konstantin is, is asking whether you stratified the sample for political ideology and uh, or level of, of populism. Um, do we do you find sort of or do we expect a more pro, uh, pronounced um, effect amongst those who are sympathetic to populist rhetoric? And then we've got a question from uh, Franz Valent, which uh, kind of is one that I also had: is that whether the lack of difference between the pro and the anti-establishment groups with respect to the negative feelings might be the result of the fact that both videos present rather moderate views of the two camps. They're like not very uh, prone to trigger intense feelings. I was also thinking that they were moderate in their language. They're not, you know, there's no, there's no foul language. There's no raised voices, et cetera. And whether kind of that kind of moderate way of, um, of uh, presenting yeah. those, those, um, those messages might play, play yeah. a role. Um, yeah, thanks for this question. So, Constantine, um, we, uh, yeah, so we, we have a, 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 a measure of, yeah, sort of, you could say sympathy to, to populism, uh, that we've, that we've used here, but, uh, that, that in itself doesn't explain much. It's, it's only when we bring in the, uh, uh, uh the voting pattern that we, uh, 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 that we see this. Uh, and, and I mean, that's interesting in itself. May actually say something about the question we used. Uh, then this Franz, the second uh, question. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, it, it could be that this, that, that, that it's just an extremity effect uh, or, or yeah, um, a too moderate effect. Um, the problem here is also that uh, uh um, at one point the question is really what what are we trying to manipulate are we trying to manipulate uh, a particular argument or are we manipulating uh the 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 extremity of the language and uh and yes i think i mean it's definitely um, um it's definitely the our results definitely validate the view that 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 follow-up experiments should distinguish between those two uh, different manipulations, uh, yeah, uh, and the same goes for uh, Anika. What, what you mentioned regarding raised voices, I mean that 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 would be uh, yet another uh, 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 way of uh, adding adding more dimensionality to the to the experiment. If so anyone wants to do these things, then. <laughs> Um, well, actually, I have another question in the Q and A that very much goes into into that direction. Before I, I hand over to, to Maritz, um, Gunnar asks whether um, uh, whether you consider that the anti elite video might have be too blunt for the non uh, RRP uh, RPP voters to take seriously. Um, would you expect a different effect if the message would be more detailed, maybe even containing disinformation? Of course, that's always a little bit problematic in, yeah. in experiments, but uh, that might be another kind of another way of, of, of thinking about the, yeah. um, the treatment. Yeah, thanks, Gunnar. Um, 
Yeah, so it's interesting that the previous question is that we're too too moderate, <laughs> and you think it's too blunt. Um, yeah, of, of course this 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 could have happened. I don't think we ever. I don't think we validated this 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 particular measure against authenticity or something. That that would have been a good thing to have done before uh, 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 before the the experiment. Um, yeah, and again, if you want to add this information, I think uh, uh, I mean yeah, then then your experiment also becomes about this information, and it becomes harder. It becomes about a populist party using this information, so it becomes harder to distinguish, particularly the effect of anti anti elite rhetoric. Okay, thank you. So two quick uh, last questions. Uh, one is by Maurits, and then we have one uh, anonymous attendee. Um, Maurits, you can, you should be able to talk. Yes. Okay. Uh, thanks, Hi, so much for this uh, cool presentation. Again, so much appreciation for the work you're doing. It's really cool. Um, and really moving this literature forward in really cool ways. I was wondering, are we, when we react emotionally to politicians, are we, are we really reacting to their ideas or is it really also their faces and the way they speak, that that is what really triggers us. And of course, that's also because of the ideas behind it. But does your, maybe your experiment here show that just a kind of a dry representation of those ideas abstracted from the politicians who might actually express them um, doesn't do much, suggests that in the end, it's only because someone like Thierry Baudet or uh, um, or Geert Wilders, whom we have very particular feelings um, well, about, yes. and that 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 that, it, that it is what triggers us. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot, Maurits, for your kind words and also for your uh, um, uh, for for setting me up to introduce you to the work of Micah Homan, uh, my my uh, PhD student, and and she does exactly this. So she's looking at at emotional responses to faces, and yes, people have quite immediate responses to uh, the faces of politicians. Uh, on the previous slide, I mentioned, for example, a paper uh, is called uh, Yikes, Are We Disgusted by Politicians? For example, it shows that we experience physiological disgust if we watch pictures of, the out of an out-party politician. Um, but also, and I think this is relevant for, for, for this paper as well, um, once we, so we have a condition in which the in-party and, in and out-party politicians commit a moral violation. So they, they bribe people or something. Now this moral violations condition has no effect on how, how we respond to the out-party out politician, but it has a very strong effect on how we perceive the in-party politician. So that also shows that, uh, uh, um, and this effect is about as strong as sort of the, the effect uh, 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 that we see towards an out-party politician who, who, yeah, with no more extra information. So um, it shows very much that, that immediate responses are very important and, and, and moral judgments are, uh, are also very important in terms of uh, uh, our emotional responses to it. Uh, so it's definitely a much more complex story than the, the, the story we, we've just uh, presented. And finally, maybe maybe as a um, sort of a theoretical um, proposition or a, a proposal, uh, we have a, a one of the um, one of the members of the audience saying whether uh, your uh, whether the, the the communication theory of spiral of silence that there if there's no, if there's no opposing opposing voice uh, will get sort of a downward spiral. Whether that whether that might help you. Um, explain especially the um, pro-establishment voice uh, rhetoric kind of uh, logic. Yeah, that, that, that could very much be a mechanism. Um, uh, but in the end, I, I do think, I do, I do think, uh, uh, you know, the pro-elite, the non-populist parties that they it's not as if they have no response to to populists. They they do, um, but this defense is not not really uh, formatted or formulated, I should say, as a pro-establishment voice. Is rather they want to talk about, 
yeah, the lack of respect, the lack of 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 of, of intelligence um, that these populist parties display, um, and so it's not really, at, at least, but but you know, if 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 participants today have very good examples of pro-establishment rhetoric, I'd be I'd be happy to to see it and use it, but um, but what I see lacking is 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 a strong. Uh, defense of that the, the political elite is actually uh, doing a good job. All right, thank you so much, guys. Um, I think we're sort of uh, at the at the maximum of your your time, if I uh, if I got this correctly. Yeah. And I think we're already also through all the questions from the audience. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much for uh, again for your presentation and uh, to uh, for, for coming along to the populism seminar. Um, hope that the uh, the COVID uh, related childcare situation. Oh yeah, is, is we're so much used to it now that it's uh, yeah, and then yeah. that schools back open. To exactly so thank you very much um and if you could take down your uh, your presentation that would be great and we can hand over to rodolfo and um and his presentation thank you hi everyone uh, let me um share my screen and okay Okay. Can you see uh, the, 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 my presentation? Not yet, no, at the moment. Not, not yet? Okay, not one moment. I don't know why, but... Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes, now we can see it. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Well, it's, it's uh, very interesting because I, I think that there are many points uh, in common with the this presentation. I, 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 I use a, an, an survey experiment, but I think that there are many points in common. And I will present um, a case study on, on, uh, on, on Mexico. And, and in, in, in this presentation, I, I try to I try to explore uh, which of the dimension of the populist rhetoric uh, activates polarization. Um, there, there is a, a, a consensus uh, between the literature about that there is a relationship between populist rhetoric and polarization, but we, we don't know exactly uh, which are the mechanism that uh, produce uh, such polarization. For this reason, this, this paper um, ha has a, 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 the main motivation um, to explore the question, um, not so much whether polarization happens and how to measure it, but what aspect of populists uh, do the work. And in this sense, the, the, the research question of, of this presentation is on whether and how, especially and how, populist rhetoric induce uh, polarization. In, um, in, in this case, um, focusing on, on a single case study, um, and in, in, in Mexico with the, act, the, the current president, Andrés Manuel López Obrador. Um, and the, the paper 
depart from, a, from the, the, the well-known ideational approach to populism. Um, uh, and my paper, my paper proposed the hypothesis that anti-elite message are more likely to generate polarization than politician positive mentioning of the people. As, as you know, the um, ideational approach to populists uh, propose three dimension of, of the concept of populist. One is a Manichaean conception of the politics. Uh, the second one is uh, an idea about a corrupt elite. And the th third one is about an, uh, a pure people. Uh, in, in this paper, I, I try to explore uh, which of the two uh, dimensions, the, the, two, the two second dimensions, produce uh, polarization in the Mexican case. And, well, polarization is a concept that all we know, but it, it's good to, to express what is the meaning of polarization in, in, this, in this paper. And polarization, in, in this sense, seems to lead to conflict through the in-group, out-group out -group discrimination. Polarization is the opposite of tolerance. And, and simply defined, tolerance is a person willingness to support the civic and political right of fellow citizen with whom uh, she disagree. Uh, regarding regarding the, the method that I use in, in this paper, um, uh, I, um, first, I, this work employs human textual analysis. Um, in, in social media, uh, specifically in Andres Manuel López Obrador, the Mexican president, Facebook account. Uh, and secondly, um, this paper uh, conducts one laboratory based experiment to measure the activation of polarization in reaction to these to this two different attributes of uh, populist uh, discourse. Uh, in, in this vein, the, the, the design of the experiment has um, one treatment condition um, in, in which uh, I, um, I use a, a one minute video clip of Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador delivering a positive mentioning of the people message and a, a treatment condition uh, in which I uh, um, the, the student view a one minute video, video clip of the president, the Mexican president, um, delivering an evil and conspiring edit message. Um, well, uh, I, I, in this paper, I, I test a validated human based approach to measuring populist rhetoric and polarization holistic grading and apply it to AMLO, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, post in Facebook and to Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador follower comments during the first two months of uh, the Mexican um, president government. Um, in this vein, I, I propose uh, this uh, scale, uh, in this scale, I consider with the value zero uh, a comment in this category uh, or, or comment in this category are those comments that uh, use few, if any, polarized elements. Uh, I assign the value one to those comments uh, that include polarized elements, but either does not use them consistently or temper them by including non-polarized -polar elements. 
Finally, I use uh, the value two for those comments um, who, uh, who are extremely polar, polarized. And these comments are opposed in a hard tone to tolerance to other groups or to open mindedness. Well, I, I have some uh, result of uh, the, the textual analysis and in, in my paper. And uh, when, when we compare um, the level of polarization of the comment and the distribution of highly polar, polar, polarized comment and polarized comment and non-polarized comment um, display a, a clear tendency to show more polar, polarization in the former than in the later, as the figure two, three uh, show. A, a finding in, fi in favor of uh, the hypothesis of this work. Um, in this figure, um, when we compare the level of polarization uh, of the comment, uh, in this case, uh, the means, uh, we find a statistically significant difference between anti elite post and uh, pure people uh, post, as the figure uh, show. Um, in the second place, I, I use an experiment design. Um, this study at Autonomous University of Querétaro was conducted in June the, of the past year. Um, in total, um, I, it was uh, 72 undergraduates participated in the experiment as, as part of a political science course. Um, in, this, in this slide, we, we can see the two treatment, uh, the pure people uh, message frame and the anti elite message frame. Um, in, in the first case, we can see to the Mexican president um, in a one minute video clip uh, saying that uh, talking about honesty as in Sweden or Denmark as well Norway we have in our country the virtue of that value our people are honest there is a great reserve of culture moral and spiritual values values to regenerate Mexico the, the idea in this case is that Lopez Obrador, the Mexican president, is, uh, uh, is emphasizing the idea of a pure people. The other treatment, the anti-elite message frame, uh, we can see uh, to Lopez Obrador, the Mexican president, um, affirming that uh, before there was corruption and there was impunity, especially for those at the very top. Uh, they did not even pay taxes, for example. And not only that, they received contract very opulent from the government, from the government purchased with privilege. This in this message, Lopez Obrador uh, highlights the idea of a uh, um, corrupt elite. Um, uh, uh, in the experiment, I use an, uh, uh, a set of open-ended question um, in which we use, uh, I use two types of, of question. Um, those, those that sought to measure polarization in abstract and general terms, and those that sought to measure polarization, considering the specific aspect of the Mexican case, more case oriented, uh, by the way. Uh, the hypothesis is that the, the amount of expressed polarization should be higher in the treatment condition 
two anti-elite treatment than in the treatment condition one, pure people uh, treatment. Well, we, we here we have um, some findings and we, we can see in, in this uh, figure that uh, we have uh, a statistically difference uh, in, in a, a group of the, the, the question that I use in the experiment. And for instance, in the, in the question about if society shouldn't have to put up with, with those who have political ideas that are extremely different from the majority. Um, the second one is uh, government must favor the poor and harm the rich. Uh, in, the, in the third, uh, those who defend the separation of power only seek to benefit the mafia of power, an, an idea that Lopez Obrador has posted uh, all the time since he took the office. And we should not accept immigrant crossing the United States from Central America to the United States. And finally, we, we, we I, I, I found a statistical dif uh, significant difference in the question about to compromise with our political opponent is dangerous because uh, it usually leads to the betrayal of our own side. Final remarks, uh, conclusion. Um, comment in, in social media uh, between the follower of, uh, of López Obrador are more polarized when AMLO, when Andrés Manuel López Obrador post mention an anti-elite message. Um, in, in this sense, experiment, experimental data suggests suggest that evil conspiring elite treatment prompt individual to more uh, polarization. Um, the findings about the so-called so -called mafia of power are somewhat worrisome as anti-elite rhetoric seems to erode one of the characteristics of a democracy that is horizontal uh, accountability. Um, this uh, result suggests that um, anti-elite framing do produce bond within, within the in-group while cre creating social distance from an antagonist toward different outgroup. In, in the case of the pa these papers, this outgroup range from rich people to, to immigrants. And this will be my, my presentation and comment or question and you are very welcome. Thank you a lot for, for uh, presenting your latest research here. Um, so let's move on to, to questions in the uh, Q&A. Um, please use the Q&A function or raise your hand to ask questions if there are any questions. I'll just give you a second to post questions. Um, Let's see. If there are no questions, then let, let me start and break the ice with a question. So if I understand correctly, you use um, posts made by the president, right, to, to encode whether they are um, pro-people or, or anti-elitist, right? Is there a problem in this treatment that, it, that um, respondents may be familiar with whom, from whom this um, post comes. So this is conflated not only with the rhetoric that's used, but also with who the person is and the office and the political orientation and other dimensions than just populism. What are your thoughts on this? Um, 
I, I am not sure if I understand your your question. Um, the the I, I explore the follower um, the comment of follower to Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador in Facebook. Yes, and uh, um, I, I have a. Um, 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 sample uh, of uh, two two thousand hundred of of comments in in the Andres Manuel López Obrador uh, Facebook account. Um, but I, I am not sure if you are you are your question is about the, the sample that I use. So if I understood your presentation correctly in, in the latter part of it, you present yes. more experimental evidence, no? Yes. Exactly. So I was interested in their experimental design treatments and whether um, respondents in this experiment may realize from whom the, treat the, the treatments are and, and how they react to this conflating the rhetoric together with the person. Do you understand what I mean? Uh, my sample is, is a, my sample is, was uh, with a student at my university and the, the end of my sample was um, seven two student. Okay. And I am um, the 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 trait the treatment uh, I have uh, a, a, a two treatment or um, one is with uh, um, with uh, the pure people massage frame and the second one is with anti elite massage frame and. What I found is that the uh, the anti elite message from produce more polarization than the pure people message frame. Okay. So, so if I understand correctly, and we have two questions in the uh, in the Q and A, I'll move on to them in a second. Are those treatments based on speeches? From uh, the president or not? Yes. Okay. So yeah. I, okay, um, okay. That, that's that's my question. Let, let me move on okay. up to two questions in the Q and A. So we have an anonymous question asking, um, "What your findings actually mean for the nature of democratic engagement and disengagement?" Uh, due to social media, because anti-elitist messages attract more polarization. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on, on this? I well, I I, I think that um, um, this this finding has important consequence in terms of of uh, me, of. Miti policy mitigation, uh, because the, the 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 findings show that um, the 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 anti elite message is the make is the attribute of the uh, ideational approach to populism that produce uh, polarization. Um, the level of polarization among uh, the student that receive the pure people message is statistically uh, significant um, lesser than uh, the anti-elite message frame. And I, I think that uh, this generic, this generic uh, 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 argument about um, and, 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 uh, and a corrupt elite um, is um, is the cause of is the mechanisms that active uh, 
populist attitude. And especially in, in Latin America, um, um, and Andres Manuel López Obrador, but also other re recent um, election, like in Chile, for example, or like Bolsonaro in Brazil, they used the, the same um, frame, the, the, the same anti-elite message frame. And I think that uh, this finding uh, has important implication in terms of, uh, for example, um, policies that regulate um, campaigns. And uh, I think that this is a, is, a, is a finding that could contribute to design um, policies in these terms. Okay, thank you. thanks for your response. I have one last question before closing the session, given that we are uh, rather close to the end of our session. So, so Matthias asked in the chat that, um, says in the chat, this is really interesting. And there's one question about how you conceptualize and operationalize polarization. Because you, you argue that it's the opposition of tolerance, but um, he's, he wonders whether there are different ways of, of measuring um, polarization, for example, effective polarization, ideological polarization. How does your um, understanding of polarization relate to this literature? What are your thoughts on this? Yes, uh, and I, I will look for the slide with. Yes, I, I, I know that polarization is a contested concept and especially measure polarization from Maurice Fiorina and his, his idea about a, a B-model distribution of preference, affective polarization, partisanship polarization. In this case, I, um, I propose a different measure of polarization in which the opposition uh, the, in terms of in-group, out-group of, uh, uh, of different uh, nature uh, is, the, is the main argument, is the main conceptual argument about uh, polarization. Um, in this sense, my, my, my paper is uh, posed a, 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 a different idea on, on how conceptualize uh, polarization. No, I, I, I think that um, this is not the, the, the traditional um, um, con conceptualization of polarization. And in... in, in in this sense, my, my conceptualization has to do with, is inductive, it has to do with, I, I, I could see in the, in the um, comment on the social media, okay? And particularly, uh, I, I, I propose that polarization is the, opposite of, of tolerance. Okay, okay uh, thank you Rodolfo for, for sharing your research and responding to these questions. Um, I think this was really interesting. Let me then close uh, the session. So uh, thanks again for your presentation. Also, I, I, I thank Kais, who's not with us anymore, is um, back to childcare, I guess. Um, so, so let me briefly um, thank everybody who presented this season, but also all the questions from the audience. This is really what makes this seminar so interesting and exciting that we have the opportunity to talk about the latest research. Um, and thus, we have an open call for the next season again. Um, Andrea mentioned this in the beginning already. So um, if, you, if you're interested to present your research uh, in the seminar, check out our submission page where you can enter a couple of basic uh, 
pieces of information, just such as the title and abstract and the month you would like to present. Uh, this will close on the 14th of February, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so we have a couple of nice, interesting presentations for the next season. We will kick off the next season, season and that's something we can announce already, with a round table on how the field of populism has developed. And we have uh, three, three stars, which is really exciting, uh, with uh, Paul Taggart, Nana Meyer, and uh, Hans-Georg Betz, who will share their views on how the field has developed over the last two decades or even more, maybe. Um, so this is going to be extremely exciting. So uh, let me close by saying that uh, I really enjoyed this season. I hope you have a lovely semester break for those of you where this was the last week of teaching and for those of you where it's still going on or starts again, hang in there. And um, we see you then in the middle of March and we really look forward to all your submissions for the next season. All the best and take care.